Inflame Thyself with Prayer, Part 3 It is evident that from ancient times humanity recognised the spiritual dimension of life and sought to come into contact with it, an aspiration that inevitably evolved unique forms of expression according to the varying natures of different cultures. However, that was all to change as the ancient world was irrevocably transformed by the empire building of Alexander the Great, who gave the ancient world a new focal point and a common language that enables the philosophical and religious beliefs of many cultures to interact. Alexander opened up the world in a way that was to have far-reaching effects, for within a century of his passing, Rome became the focal point of the known world and succeeded to much of Alexander's empire. Subsequently, for more than 500 years, civilization meant Roman civilization. During the first centuries of our era, the Roman Empire had become a melting pot of countless speculative ideas and belief systems, many of which were a potpourri of spiritual ideals and dynamics, compiled from many sources and traditions. Out of this melee, Christianity emerged as a dominant religious and political system. As times changed, the schools of the mysteries disappeared, partly prescribed and partly absorbed into the mainstream of public religion, many moving beyond the immediate reach of the administration. The following hymn, written in the late 4th century by St. Gregory Nazianzen of Constantinople, clearly echoes something of the mystery schools, and I quote, O all-transcendent God, What other name describes you? What words can sing your praises? No word at all denotes you. What mind can probe your secrets? No mind at all can grasp you. Alone beyond the power of speech, all men can speak of springs from you. Alone beyond the power of thought, all men can think of stems from you. All things proclaim you. Things that can speak, things that cannot. All things revere you, things that have reason, things that have not. The whole world's longing and pain mingle about you. All things breathe you a silent prayer, a silent hymn of your own composing. All that exists you uphold. All things in concert move to your orders. You are the end of all that is. You are one, you are all. You are none of the things that are, You are not a part and not the whole. All names are at your disposal. How shall I name you? The only unnameable. What mind's affinities with heaven can pierce the veils above the clouds? Mercy, all transcendent God, what other name can describe you? End quote. If there was a place where the ethos of the mysteries survived, it was in the monasteries, that appeared with so much force and vitality during the latter part of the 4th century. These small communities of people, dedicated to a life of prayer and meditation, continued the spiritual aspirations of the mystery schools, but after a different fashion. Alas, little of the schools have survived the test of time, except perhaps in the writings of Dionysus the Areopagite, otherwise known today as the Pseudo-Dionysus who is generally believed to have been a Syrian monk whose life spanned the end of the 5th century and the beginning of the 6th. The Dionysian corpus consists of five titles, the Divine Names, the Mystical Theology, the Celestial Hierarchy, the Ecclesiastical Hierarchy and the Epistles. These profoundly influential books are not simply historical documents, they are essentially a spiritual teaching whose subject is the nature of the interior life of the soul and the permanent reality that is the substrate of its existence and whose expression is an exquisite reflection of the mystical philosophy and spiritual life of the ancient world, sublimated in Christianity. In the words of Dionysius himself, and I quote, These things thou must not disclose to any of the uninitiated by whom I mean those who cling to the objects of human thought, and imagine 
there is no super-essential reality beyond, and fancy that they know by human understanding him that has made darkness his secret place. And if the divine initiation is beyond such men as these, what can be said of others yet more incapable thereof, who describe the transcendent cause of all things by qualities drawn from the lowest order of being, while they deny that it is in any way superior to the various ungodly delusions which they fondly invent in the ignorance of this truth. End quote. From C. E. Rolts, Translation of the Anisus Areopagite, published in 2004, page 192. In the same work, the author writes, and I quote, Unto this darkness, which is beyond light, we pray that we may come and may attain unto vision through the loss of sight and knowledge, and that, in ceasing thus, to see or to know that which is beyond all perception and understanding, for this emptying of our faculties is true sight and knowledge, we may offer him that transcends all things the praises of a transcendent hymnody, which we shall do by denying or removing all things that are. Like as men who, carving a statue out of marble, remove all the impediments that hinder the clear perspective of the latent image and by this mere removal display the hidden statue itself in its hidden beauty. End quote from the same work, page 194. The influence of Plotinus, and indeed of much of the ancient world, is obvious in the Dionysian corpus. Indeed, it may be said that through this Syrian monk, the ancient world was able to pass on a most important legacy, as many have since discovered. His work is a call to a life of prayer and meditation, beyond the reaches of the mundane world. But this does not exclude the majority of us from engaging in prayer, nor of benefiting from what he has to say. Remember, prayer is communing with God, and the only prerequisite is that we engage attentively and with respect. However, prayer does also lie at the heart of a sacred science of spiritual development, barely known beyond the quiet waters of the sanctuary. This sacred science requires spiritual tools and methods, and in prayer we have the most useful and effective tool that we can ever hope for, because it is part of us, and is both readily available and immediately accessible. Prayer is a means by which we can open the doorway of the sanctuary that lies within the hidden temple of the heart. Thus it is said, invoke often and inflame thyself with prayer. It is a simple truth known to those who frequent its cloisters, and without which the work of spiritual regeneration would be virtually impossible. The obstacles that stand in the way of entering that inner temple and engaging in such prayer are the attitudes and preconceptions that form the major part of our self-image and worldview, inherited from our family values and convictions concerning spiritual things, with our schooling and social connections contributing further. Inevitably, some of this conditioning, which at some point was useful to us, is now redundant. Yet we continue to hold on to it. Unfortunately, much of this redundant conditioning, gleaned indiscriminately during our formative years, is little more than a medley of misconceptions and half-truths that have been maintained since childhood with such loyalty and determination that even in adulthood we frequently and often successfully defend them against all reason. We forget, perhaps, that when we were children, we were taught as children. The teachings we were given concerning the spiritual dimensions of our existence, if indeed we were given any, were designed for the minds of children and not for the minds of adults. Thus our conceptions of God, as we enter puberty, are inevitably childish. And if at first we believe that God is perfect and omnipotent, we believe this as children and not as adults. As juveniles, the incongruities in the world, particularly concerning injustice, suffering, warfare and disease, challenge our beliefs and turn many of us away from God. After all, if there is a God, 
He would not allow injustice and suffering to exist, would he? For some of us, these incongruities of the world are checked by a simple, almost blind faith in what we have been taught, a naive trust just waiting to be challenged. Thus armed with the juvenile view of the spiritual dimension of our existence, we sally forth into adulthood. However, the kind of prayer that opens the doorway of the inner temple requires something more than superstitious sentimentality or a vague belief in deity. It requires more than the mindless repetition of vaguely understood words because prayer is first and foremost a personal relationship between the soul and God. Therefore, the clearer the concept the soul has of God, the more able is the soul to focus its attention upon God. Such an undertaking, when approached in the right way, is capable of releasing the soul from its prison of self-image. Consequently, one of the most important tasks we can undertake is the conscious development of a more mature concept of God. But if we are to do this, then we must begin with acknowledging that God is not some vague abstraction or distant entity, but is the source, ground and destiny of our being, and that creation is both sane and full of love, proceeding in every detail as God planned it, and as such is perfect. We may not understand that perfection, but then do we have a clear idea of what we mean by the term perfect? The word describes that which is complete and without flaw, and as such, in its absolute sense, applies to God alone, for God is, by definition, that which is perfect. Unfortunately, all we can rely on to assist our judgment are relative correspondences and reference points gleaned from our life experiences, which are as yet insufficient for comprehending the absolute nature of God, and because of our incomplete understanding there is always the possibility of assuming that creation is like God in a state of absolute perfection, a condition that is obviously untrue. Nevertheless, it is true to say that creation functions precisely as God intends, which is to say that the will of God is completely fulfilled in and by creation. Creation, then, is in perfect harmony with divine will and as such is completely without error, and consequently without flaw, although it has yet to attain a state of ultimate or absolute perfection. This idea is not so difficult to understand if we recognize that the will of God is fulfilled in creation through the process we currently know as evolution. It's a word that means to unfold, although it is commonly used today by the exponents of materialism as a term to describe the progressive development of creation from simple to more complex forms. Nevertheless, from a spiritual perspective, creation fulfills the will of God by evolving to a predetermined goal, as yet barely comprehended by humanity. For humanity, like the rest of creation, is evolving in accordance with God's will, and as yet to attain the final state of absolute perfection, that can give a complete understanding of the purpose and meaning of existence. Prayer is also an art, an art that combines thought and feeling in a manner that is best summed up in the ancient formula inflame thyself with prayer and invoke often. This means that one should involve real feeling when praying, for such prayer is a vehicle which under the right conditions will bear the soul aloft as if upon a magic carpet to higher and more sublime levels of consciousness. Yet for so many people, emotions are rarely experienced other than as a reaction to a specific event, and more often than not are associated with powerful and very physical sensations. This is not surprising, considering that society barely recognises the need for emotional development beyond the ability to function within the normal constraints of everyday life. Such primitive, self-focused conditioning limits the potential for spiritual development in that it imperceptibly supports egoism, which is the antithesis of spiritual gnosis. Selfless or non-selfish emotions invariably involve giving. The simple pleasure experienced by everyday kindness 
inspires not only personal well-being, but the desire for the well-being of others, which is only a short step away from fulfilling the Lord's wish that we do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Fulfilling this commandment is perhaps one of the most liberating steps we can take. It frees our thoughts and emotions from the selfish instinctive urges that dominate our life and engenders the realization that inasmuch as we are part of creation, we are a part of the divine. It is in this ideal state that we can best direct our combined thoughts and feelings towards God. This chemistry of the very substance of the soul drives prayer like Cupid's arrow straight to its object of love, God. In prayer, the motive is of fundamental importance, for when prayer is directed towards spiritual development, its potential for effect is maximized, but when directed towards material objectives, its potential is minimized. This must be understood in the context of the purpose of our existence, which we are taught is to seek the kingdom of heaven. See Matthew 6.33. Seeking the kingdom is essentially an inner or supernatural quest that takes the seeker beyond the world of the senses into realms where there are more important factors to be considered than the demands of our worldly needs. In this interior world, the soul discovers how its earthly experience is merely a reflection of events taking place therein. Such wisdom that may be gained in this world is gained through prayer, because in this spiritual environment, prayer has a direct and immediate influence, as it is essentially of the same spirit and nature of the substance found therein. However, expecting changes to be made in the exterior world of the senses through our prayers will be imprudent, as that would require altering the patterns established by natural law which is most unlikely to succeed directly. That it is noble to pray for the material well-being of others, praying for the health and safety of people, praying that they may have sufficient for their needs or that they may live in peace without threat or hindrance, is highly commendable and not to be underestimated. For although our prayers may not have any obvious or direct effect, they still have the power to influence indirectly. To understand what this means, consider as an example a typical situation where our prayers may be called upon. A country is in political turmoil. Its government is using extremely harsh measures in attempting to establish some kind of order. The consequence of this is that many people are being imprisoned, tortured or killed indiscriminately by some or all of the factions involved. The economy is in a state of collapse. Food production has ceased and famine and disease threaten. This is a very real situation in many countries today and is a situation that demands from any sensitive individual that the very least they could do, apart from giving material assistance, is to pray for peace and order to be restored. It may not seem very much, but the consequence of the combined prayers of many individuals intent upon the same objective, generates a force, a force that will influence the hearts and minds of those involved in such conflicts with a very real desire for peace. This indirect but powerful influence is generated by prayer offered to God on their behalf, because in offering one's prayers to God, they are transformed from a partisan goodwill into a universal expression of divine love. In this elevated and transformed state, the essence of our prayer becomes acceptable to the souls involved in such conflicts. Through the power and love of the divine, and in accordance with natural law, the moderating influence of our prayers is able to assist reason and compassion to overcome hatred and the desire for revenge. Thus, in due course, peace and order are restored. The scale is irrelevant whether it is one person praying for another or a small group praying for world peace, no effort is futile. When prayer is directed towards spiritual development, its effectiveness is unquestionable. For when the soul is truly caught up in prayer, it is in communion with the divine, which communicates with the soul by transforming thought into realization. 
Doubt blows away like chaff before the wind. Thought ceases and consciousness leaves the barriers separating it from its source. The soul is nourished by the radiant light of pure love and then this blessed light grows strong in holiness. Then the delusion of separateness fades away, allowing truth to filter through the coarse fibres of its earthbound consciousness and stimulates the seed of gnosis. Prayer of this nature requires commitment to its development. Its immeasurable potential is realised only through regular practice. There are no shortcuts or easy options when dealing with such prayer, for it is the secret language of the soul, and consists not merely of words, but of a chemistry of being, a chemistry that combines concentration, purity of intention, emotional control, clarity of thought and humility. The time and place are also of great importance. A quiet place, free from interruption, where one may gather one's thoughts and be still, as the Lord taught. Turning within and fixing one's attention upon the light within the inner temple, it is possible to perceive a great truth underlying the dynamics of this chemistry, a truth that not only reveals the essential commonality of the human spirit, but also reveals the true nature of the self. Unfortunately, many prefer to avert their gaze when thus confronted, for old tribalisms linger in the memory and take a long time to change, especially when the will to change is reluctant. This is a great shame, because the answer to many of our problems lies in discovering this inner reality. When Dudley Wright wrote, Prayer is not the condescension of the eternal to the human, but rather the ascension of the human towards the union with the eternal, he revealed a fundamental truth that so many have either forgotten or have never realised. Indeed, our civilization has for so long thought of prayer as being simply a petition from the weak to the strong, from the poor to the wealthy, from the meek to the powerful, that the essence and purpose of prayer has long been hidden behind a veil of misconceptions. Consequently, in this increasingly secular world, the use of prayer declines whilst the need for meaning in life grows ever more urgent. Finally, when understood rightly, prayer opens a door that gives us access to a greater world of consciousness than we commonly imagine and enables people to articulate their spiritual life in a meaningful and wholesome context. It is a door wherein the emancipation of the soul is attained not through denying or rejecting the divine, but engaging and communing with it. The mundane world is not the only world, for we are not only children of earth, but also of starry heaven. Indeed, our race is of heaven alone, for the divine is the source, ground and destiny of our being, and it is in that and in that alone we shall find the context and meaning of our life. Thus when the soul prays, the soul arouses the divine element that lies latent within it. In my understanding, this is nowhere better summed up than in the following verse by Mar Francis, prior of the ODP until his death in 1991. And I quote, The mind is a garden named delight, wherein God dwells concealed from sight. Therein pray as did Jesus before Easter Day. Then thou shalt know, with vision clear, that heaven's within us now and here. Sorrows on earth shall sometimes cease, in the presence of the Lord of peace, for he has risen that we may be, one with him eternally. Here we must draw to a close part three of Inflame Thyself with Prayer. Thank you.